Welcome to the Seventh Clarifying po Podcast broadcast on Twitch Mondays and Fridays and posted on YouTube. We are your hosts, Dave and Mike. On our podcast today, we will be reading the root verses of the Middle Way and discussing the relationship with living in the digital age. First, to get a distillation of what we will be talking about today, Mike suggested that we read the Heart Sutra which was developed in relationship or um, in concordance with this. We really don't quite know. Let me get that up for you, Mike. This is a new translation by Titna Han. The insight that brings us to the other shore. Avalokiteshvara, while practicing deeply with the insight that brings us to the other shore, suddenly discovered that all of the five skandhas are equally empty, and with this realization he overcame all ill being. Listen, Shariputra, this body itself is emptiness, and emptiness itself is this body. This body is not other than emptiness, and emptiness is not other than this body. The same is not true of feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. Listen, Sariputra, all phenomena bear the mark of emptiness. Their true nature is the nature of no birth, no death, no being, no non-being, no defilement, no purity, no increasing, no decreasing. That is why in emptiness, body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness are not separate self-entities. The eighteen realms of phenomena, which are the six sense organs, the six sense objects, and the six sense consciousnesses, are also not separate self-entities. The twelve links of interdependent arising and their extinction are also not separate self-entities. Ill-being, the causes of ill-being, the end of ill-being, the path, insight, and attainment are also not separate self-entities. Whoever can see this no longer needs anything to attain. Bodhisattvas who practice the insight that brings us to the other shore see no more obstacles in their mind, and because there are no more obstacles in their mind, they can overcome all fear, destroy all wrong perceptions, and realize perfect nirvana? All Buddhas in the past, present, and future, by practicing the insight that brings us to the other shore, are all capable of attaining authentic and perfect enlightenment. Therefore, Sariputra, it should be known that the insight that brings us to the other shore is a great mantra, the most illuminating mantra, the highest mantra, a mantra beyond compare, the true wisdom that has the power to put an end to all kinds of suffering. Therefore, let us proclaim a mantra to praise the insight that brings us to the other shore. Gate, gate, haragate, harasamgate, bodhi svaha. Wow, thank you very much, Mike. That was great. I'd like to uh, ask you what you think this has to do with um, the realization of emptiness or the distillation of the topic that we're about to talk about? Well, this is, as I said, a new translation by Titnat Han, and it is looser than the original Sanskrit or Chinese. The oldest version that we have is in Chinese, and some argue that it was written in China as opposed to in India. But regardless, the term, the insight that brings us to the other shore, is uh, the translation of the Sanskrit term Prajnaparamita. And there's a whole class of Prajnaparamita sutras which deal with this concept of wisdom or insight. And the ultimate insight, knowing, is the recognition of emptiness, 
So what this represents, Avalokiteshvara, who's the bodhisattva of compassion in the Mahayana pantheon, in deep prajnaparamita, in insight meditation, penetrated through the illusion and witnessed, it beheld and understood that all things are empty, which in this context, uh, I think um, this translation makes it fairly clear. The emptiness represents uh, a lack of being a separate self-entity. So it does not mean non-existent. It does not mean in, in a nihilistic sense. It means not having any unique essential quality but being wholly dependent on everything else so it doesn't have an existential quality and it also doesn't have a non-existential quality would you say that that's true uh in the sense that existential reifies things yes I, i'd say that it. No, no thing, no skanda, which in this instance, the skandas are body, feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness, uh, nor any of the six sense objects or five aggregates exist apart from other things. So there's, in earlier translations, they simply say there's no eye, no nose, no ear, and so forth. And this doesn't mean that noses don't exist that we all don't have noses on the front of our face it just means that the nose is not separate from the olfactory bulb from the brain from the respiratory system the nose is, is not its own independent entity it's dependent on the whole rest of the body and likewise the whole the rest of the body is dependent on the entire universe in that sense and here i presented just the um the three wisdom categories that are presented by the um, by Bashika school or the the categories of existence. You find the these are the five skandhas here: rupa form, vijna consciousness, tamja perception, tamska formations, and vedana sensation. And from that, obviously, as you just said we see all of these objects manifest themselves. Yep, and we see right away when you've got six cognitive objects, that in and of itself is uh, fairly, it's not an arbitrary differentiation, but when you have an object, that object can usually be seen as well as touched, smelled, tasted, occasionally heard. So one object can fall into six of those different categories. Right. Yep. And we see later on in the text uh, where Nagarjuna specifically addresses the skandhas and their relationship to the object and to emptiness. Um, so super interesting. And to definitely tune in for later, we won't um, necessarily be covering the nature of the object. Um, and the skandhas in depth today, but I wanted to go and just talk about them a little bit so we understand um, and give some context about what it is that, um, you know, we are talking about when we're saying something exists. Um, it follows that form of the, the skandhas that I had available to us that we can see on the screen now. So we have the, the five skandhas, the 12 ayatanas, and the 18 datus, which are just essentially the, the primary elements or sources of experience that are manifestly particular. Right, so they take on their own aspect of the object. But in the Buddhist sense, these are a manifestation of the object's form. So there's kind of an inversion 
where the creation of it of experience manifests the existence of the sense organs, the cognitive objects, the base faculties, and the primary consciousnesses. Because later on, when we're talking about looking for a aspect of our physical con of our consciousness or of our psychophysical aggregates, as the Dalai Lama's uh, translator calls them, Nirvana is the removal or the quieting, the realization of the emptiness of these objects, and in so so doing, that Nirvana is that relationship with these things where they're like blown out, right? So in this way, they have to be a manifestation from consciousness outwards so that they can be retracted as one becomes more wise. Instead of being the instantiators of reality, the instantiation of reality is back further in consciousness. And the faculties to interact with those objects of consciousness are a manifest property or a subvening property of the supervening skandhas. So I think that's important to realize as well, is that they're, they're not, there's no upward causation in Buddhism. We see only downward causation, at least in this school. Yeah, what they do, they sort of bypass the naive realism of identifying the image of an object with the object itself, and then they further separate the... Oh, it's gone now. Um, I'm well, sorry. I'll put it back. Right. That's okay. No, you can... The, the, the 12 ayatanas, the things quote unquote out there in the world that can be perceived interact with a being's capacity to perceive them in different uh in different modes and then that in turn the interaction between them creates its own consciousness uh capable of holding on to mental formations uh, so there's a there's a separate there's a distinction given between what is seen and the act of seeing and then the consciousness of sight and it seems slightly repetitive or redundant but again as you said the Dalai Lama indicates that as one becomes more aware of these things and is able to study them it's not that sight is vanished or that the ear faculty is gotten rid of it's simply able to one is able to observe the the consciousness itself absent any input any input data and one is able to recognize the difference between the input data and then the consciousness that contains that right yeah, and I think that's really important for realizing what's going on in the type of world that we're living in now, right? Where it seems as though um, we're encountering what we would call existent objects and non-existent objects all the time. Now, non-existence is not very well defined in Buddhism, as we were talking about earlier um, off stream, but I think that we can definitely start to consider virtual objects as non-existent objects. Well, and a lot of real objects as non-existent in the sense that people think they exist and weigh them down with lots of symbolic weight and symbolic value. Right, and it's important to realize that when we're reading the text that we're about to read, what is being referred to as existent is the five skandhas, the 12 ayatanas, the 18 dhatus. This is what's being referred to as the existent, right? Because this is the school that's being argued against in the chapter that we'll be reading. 
Now, there's a number of schools that are being argued against, but when we when we see existent and non-existent, the Sarvastivada or the Vaibhashika school particularly are going to be, uh, these are the same school, just two different names. Um, this is the school that's being argued against um, because our author for the middle way is interested in finding a path that doesn't incorporate existence and non-existence at all that finds a middle path between the two which we'll find out um, in our dedicatory verse what that is uh, yeah mike did you want to read that i have it on the um i have it on the page for you okay yeah i just wanted to yeah sure address that where the um the earlier schools of thought the abhidharma schools of thought they rejected the existence of a self of a person but they held on to uh a sense of atman where you had these it was almost an atomism you had these particles and so what one of those datus a uh, a datum a sound datum or a touch datum that itself could be a dharma that itself could be existent and nagarjuna is responding to their criticisms of uh, the doctrine of emptiness, um, they assert that it is nihilistic, saying nothing exists. And what he's arguing is that when you try to pin these things down, say that there is a an independent uh, eye faculty that is perceived by the eye consciousness and whatnot, um, that it that in turn freezes essentially everything and uh and produces the very nihilism that they're seeking to overcome i also think it's it's interesting that uh in recognizing that there is no self we see the abhidharma school um hanging on to concepts that we see a lot of people want to hang on to right the skandhas are aggregates or heaps right which are, um, you know, these bundles of um, whatever neurons or uh, selves, I guess, or cells, um, bundles of ideas, like we were talking about with memes. Uh, yeah, cortexes and how they interact. Cortexes. Like if you want to look at sure because the. If you want to look at this from a neurological perspective, you know, the eye faculty that could be an analogized to the visual cortex. Right. But then eye consciousness is going to be accessing memory and prefrontal cortical right. activity. And that there's the right. the perception, there's the sensation uh, or the perception of um and and again, th those are differentiated here, but there's the raw visual data and then there's the interpretation. And that's where you get the separation between sensation and perception and between a faculty and a consciousness. And yeah, they're trying to say that these things are still their own independent entities. But right. as again, as neuroscience has borne out, all of those different faculties interact with each other. and. Uh, and as Nagarjuna bore out, they're fundamentally non-existent, <laughs> which we'll be talking about here soon. But I just want to um, rip off a little bit of what you were talking about there in that uh, Nagarjuna isn't necessarily denying that these objects exist or that we experience them. All right, this, the Abhidharma tradition is really beautiful for anybody who studies psychology or anybody who's interested in looking at their own mind right because this this document here this this picture is not very different from anything you would find in a modern uh textbook on psychology of perception right i mean not much has changed um in our basic understanding of the way we experience the world, right? And part of that is because 
you know, anybody with basic introspective abilities is going to be able to see that. What's interesting about this is that it's a development of a whole bunch of people introspecting together and then introspecting about their own introspections in a methodological way and then using that methodology, meditation, um, debate uh, to form this categorical understanding of the mechanisms th by which one is really entrenched in the world, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's an incredible system. And I think one thing Nagarjuna was responding to that really sees its fullest flower in the Zen tradition is recogn recognizing the system itself as becoming an attachment and becoming something that this is a this is a fantastic model uh but it is still a model and it is empty in the sense that these are all words and descriptions and patterns that we're applying to the uh the soup and the stream of experience that we all exist within my favorite so here we've got some skara which is formations that word gets translated so many different ways. You've got formations, mental formations. I've seen it translated as choice. I've seen it translated as action, decision, free will. I think one possible anachronistic translation could be cognition. And if one were to translate samskara as cognitions, then you would have something very similar to what yeah, we're working with nowadays. Well, I think if you look at, um, I think you're absolutely right about that, right? If you look at um, how they're related to each other, we see that perception, formations, and sensation um, are all in relationship to validly knowable phenomena, which is what we were talking about earlier off stream again. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which sensations, I think, and I just realized the difference between a perception and a sensation is hallucinations would probably fall under the category of perceptions but not sensations right well they, they wouldn't be, be something... pramanas they wouldn't be valid formations right so then the trick becomes distinguishing between the valid and the invalid ones right and there's a number of different methodologies that are developed by later buddhist scholars um like dignaga and dharmakirti um, and i'm sure others that i'm not familiar with Chandrakirti probably, um, that distinctively discuss how it is that one differentiates between the two. Oh, very good. Um, so that's something that we could possibly look at in a, a later podcast, but definitely a, a very in-depth subject um, that well, I would say goes somewhat far afield and in this realm of really examining the nature of the constructed object. Um, and because all of these, as I said earlier, are the acknowledgement that like we do construct things and it takes on a common form across human beings because we have a common ontology or biology, um, even cross-culturally, right? Seems everybody has these sensations, right? That are, that are uniform and described here, right? It it would be you'd be hard agree. pressed to find somebody without a disability who would say, "I don't have a body faculty or a tongue faculty." No, but it is heavily conditioned uh, at the earliest ages by language and culture. So, color, for sure. instance, is a fantastic example. Um, we think of colors in different languages as just different translations but a lot of times the spectrum itself which is continuous right the dividing lines are put in different places sure. the dividing line between this color at the far left end and then the colors at the next to it on and on to the far right hand side and so you'll and what they find is if one is from if if one is presented with two similar culture two similar colors and they're from a culture where those two colors have different names they fall under two different categories say it's um 
a teal and a turquoise. Uh, one could call those blue and green in if if one is used to differentiating them or if they if the two colors fall within the same category the same name it's physically more difficult to differentiate them they look similar if one only has one word to apply to that family of spectra versus if one has two different words to apply to it so you're right we all have bodies we all have roughly extremely similar, if not identical, sensory apparatus. Um, and then those are immediately conditioned by the, uh, by the consciousnesses, by what we absorb over the process of development. Absolutely. I think that's a, an interesting observation. And I couldn't help, I can't help but just mention um, the, you know, the, the example of Eskimos, right, who are said to be able to differentiate like 50 different colors of blue that we would oh, just I wasn't... not be able to even imagine the variation because the the different variations in color of snow can determine the conditions that one is faced in uh, the the area that they're live they're living in so there's just a a multitude of of different words for these slightly different version you know variations of blue I wasn't familiar that that extended to color. I know with the Inuit languages, there was a lot of early confusion because they were using what effectively amounted to adjectives. So like, yes, we have, we have lots of different words for snow too. Heavy snow, light snow, sleet, fat, thick flakes versus... It, it, you can use adjectives to come up with a lot of different descriptors, but it's likely from the color perspective that they they may have more finely trained senses in that particular spectrum versus if one is living in a very lush tropical environment uh being able to distinguish between the shade of red that is edible and the shade of red that is poisonous is very important when gathering fruit and so just again, to riff off of that when you live in a tropical environment for example what you have the the pygmy um, cultures that live in these tropical rainforests, they've been shown to have phenomenological differences in the way that they understand height and distance. So they have a much better ability to look up and see how high something is above them than they have the ability to determine something's distance on a plane. So if you uh. show them like a buffalo or something, on the plane, they'll think the buffalo is the size of a fly because they're, they've lived in an environment that where everything that exists is a tree that's, you know, yeah, three feet Yeah, it's much in front closer, of... yeah. but it can also be uh, a lot more three-dimensionally salient. Right. And, of course, this it, there's always the feedback loop where the different training, the different words, the different perceptions have an effect on brain development. The canonical example there is the London taxi cab driver whose uh, spatial, whose brain is physically enlarged in the area of spatial reasoning by virtue of having to memorize London streets. Yep. So there's absolutely it's, this all gets to the core of dependent co-origination where these things, it's an interdependent, it's an interactive set of feedback loops it's not just a sight proceeding to an eye faculty proceeding to an eye consciousness uh, that all feeds forward into behavior and into brain development and um and affects what one sees and how one perceives and uh yeah and and one constantly evolves as a result so what's interesting about the text that we're about to read is that it brings the the existential nature of these things into question. It says, "Yes, we ex we experience them, um, but what what does it really mean for them to be empty?" Right? Because that seems to be a very unsatisfactory answer for so many people. You know, Buddhism is a nihilistic tradition, right? It has it, it's about destroying things right it's about non-existence right we've already said it's not about non-existence and it's not about existence 
<laughs> right? Uh, which we'll essentially, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about a little bit later, and we'll we'll we see throughout uh, Nagarjuna's uh, root verses on the middle way, um, and what we a middle way start. is. So yeah, let us uh, let's let's read the dedicor- dedicatory verse to see what the the middle way is um, that we're searching for in the uh, recognition that these categories that we were talking about are empty. You want to go ahead, Mike? All right. I prostrate to the perfect Buddha, the best of teachers, who taught that whatever is dependently arisen is unceasing, unborn, unannihilated, not permanent, not coming, not going, without distinction, without identity, and free from conceptual construction. So the middle way here then is this dependent origination or dependent arising of the uh, of the experience of the individual. I guess is a good way to put it. Yes, one does not begin existing and then cease to exist. It's a the standard metaphor is a wave on the ocean. Waves are unborn and unceasing. The waves are simply a part and a process of the ocean. The water itself doesn't go anywhere. It simply is moved into a new pattern that we call a wave. The wave is not separate from the water. Right. And when we think about existent objects and non-existent objects, we think about something that is permanent in the case of an existent object, or even maybe in the case of a non-existent object. I guess there could be some permanent non-existent thing, uh, like death um, is an example given, or aging is another example that's given um, as far as non-existent permanent things. Um, that's partially, I think, what makes them non-existent um, is there permanence maybe that I, I actually think i might be wrong about that but <laughs> um but as far as existent things we definitely know that uh, their permanence is something that makes it so that we know that they they can't really exist um, because something that's permanent doesn't really have any of the qualities um, of the nature of our experience So if our experience is to be true, and part of the reason that Buddhism is so interesting is you have to constantly uh, take a look at your own experience in relationship to what they're saying and try to get rid of some of the jargon, because the jargon is what makes it, I think, so confusing and a little bit hard to get a hold of. But I think once you know the jargon and understand what they're talking about, it's a lot easier to see what it is that the aim is. And especially if you understand that the entire project is to shoot for dependent origination. If what the teacher is holding in his hand is dependent origination all the time, you can, you can start to unravel what's being said. Um, without all of the haggle that goes along with the complicated the complexities of Buddhist language and the way that they decided to write their poetry. All right, so this is the first chapter that we're going to be looking at, chapter twenty four. It's probably one of the most impactful and um, exemplifies the nature and aim of the text. Uh, I guess we could start out first by saying that the first six verses are an argument from the opposition. Um, it's traditional when you read Buddhist texts that they present the opposing view, and then they present their own view in order to be clear about what it is that they're arguing against. 
Um, for Western audiences, it's a little confusing because we're just used to people presenting views um, and defending them. And that is not necessarily what's going on in this yeah, chapter. If, if the opposing arguments or the counter arguments are presented at all, they're usually not presented first. Right. And in Buddhism, it's very traditional, if not, I think, required that you present uh, your opponent's arguments first. So most of what um, you read um, in some some texts is uh, the opponent's positions. And at some points, it's actually very difficult to suss out what the position of the author that you're reading actually is. Sometimes. Yeah. And when, when you say in Buddhism, to be clear, we're studying Indian Sanskrit-based Mahayana Buddhism, specifically the Madhyamaka school, which Nagarjuna is effectively founded. But this is not going to be identical with what Theravada Buddhists practice or the later developments. Though Nagarjuna, he's, he's foundational to both the Tibetan tradition and the Zen tradition. Uh, and you can see the seeds of both here in these texts. But this is the Mahayana had already begun to depart from the very traditional. Uh, what would ultimately become the polycanon-based traditions. And one of the ways in which they depart is the focus on emptiness and the focus on the, the complete lack of self-nature of all things. So I think you'd, you'd mentioned the Sarvastivadins earlier, and because I don't know right. if it was the Sarvastivadins and who else? The Vai... The Vaibhashika and the Sarvastivadins are the same. I think, and then there's the are... Chittamatra, which is the other school that he'll argue against in this chapter. I believe the Sarvastivadins were they're not the Theravadins, but I believe they were both of the same Vinaya uh, class of practice. So they they didn't they may not have survived, or they may have survived to the present day, but. The Theravadins are the tradition that did survive, that hewed to the strict interpretation of the suttas and the Vinayas, whereas the Mahayana, we saw in the Heart Sutra that I'm fascinated now to find out whether or not the Heart Sutra was written before or after uh, these fundamental verses on the Middle Way. And because one can see in the dedicatory verse that they're very similar in talking about the same thing, but already the Mahayana was producing sutras that were probably not actually spoken by the Buddha himself. So, but within Indian Buddhism, within this tradition, yes, there's uh, lots of forms that one needs to become familiar with. I would say being it's also true of Abhidharma. And I forget if Abhidharma is Mahayana. Oh, Abhi, Abhidharma, Abhidharma is uh the is the school that developed the five is the, the school that developed those skandhas that we were looking at. Uh, that the that specific system is talked about a lot in Vasubandhu's Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Abhidharma is certainly the core of a lot of Mahayana philosophy, but I forget if they themselves classified as such or if this is still like the pre pre split this philosophy. is definitely pre well the abhidharma believe that things exist ah yes so that would be in line with the theravada right so they each of those skandhas and datus and all the, the those things are, are are considered to be like perfectly particular Mm -hmm. They have their uh, own Abhidhar existential properties. Yes. That is the core distinction between Mahayana and um, and then the more traditionalist vehicles. Uh, yeah, Abhidharma remains an important field among both Theravada and Mahayana Buddhists. So that was the core. Do we... Are we reading or... Sure. Yeah. Did you want to? Did you want to um, start um, with the? Yeah, I with the the first three, or did you want to read all of it? I'm happy with you reading all of it. 
if you'd like. Uh, I think we should read because the notes. We should read the that... first six, I would say. Yeah, the first six to nine, and then we should go to the commentary because the sure. commentary is very critical to at least to my understanding. Oh, absolutely. And then uh, and I'll put it up next to um, next to this one. Um, and even in the. Um, the traditions, this is. This sort of poetry is somewhat gnomic because it was still within a fairly uh, memorization based scholastic environment. And the idea was that one would memorize verses like these and then be taught what they mean and right. so one would have the poem itself on hand everywhere but this is not i don't think it's expected for anybody to be able to parse this wholly on its own no no and i don't think anybody is ever expected um within these traditions to be able to do that because within the tradition it's expected and under like just the way that literature is developed and um understood and transmitted is through commentary uh, so it's it would be um, understood or read along with a commentary um, usually there's an auto commentary that's provided by the author uh, to give an understanding of what it is that they're trying to get at um, that's not exactly clear in what they've written in their verses um, sure. So the the first part here is an objection to empty emptiness is compatible with the core teachings of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths specifically, the Three Jewels, as well as um, ordinary modes of conduct. Um, so so it, we'll read through about uh, verse nine or uh, ten. I would say we should. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, do the first nine or ten. If all of this is empty, neither arising nor ceasing, then for you it follows that the Four Noble Truths do not exist. If the Four Noble Truths do not exist, then knowledge, abandonment, meditation, and manifestation will be completely impossible. If these things do not exist, the Four Fruits will not arise. Without the Four Fruits, there will be no attainers of the fruits, nor will there be the faithful. If so, the spiritual community will not exist, nor will the eight kinds of person. If the four noble truths do not exist, there will be no true dharma. If there is no doctrine and spiritual community, how can there be a Buddha? If emptiness is conceived in this way, the three jewels are contradicted. Hence you assert that there are no real fruits and no dharma. The dharma itself and the conventional truth will be contradicted. We say that this understanding of yours, of emptiness and the purpose of emptiness, and of the significance of emptiness, is incorrect. As a consequence, you are harmed by it. The Buddha's teaching of the Dharma is based on two truths, a truth of worldly convention and an ultimate truth. Those who do not understand the distinction drawn between these two truths do not understand the Buddha's profound truth. And that is the core, I would argue. Uh, well, it may not be the core, but it certainly is the foundation. Starting with seven, for sure, right? We say that this understanding of yours of emptiness and the purpose of emptiness and of the significance of emptiness is incorrect. That yeah, that being, is where Nagarjuna shifts from right. the interlocutor's voice to his own. Right, and he's saying that these ideas that one is unable to attain the three jewels, um, one is unable to attain the four fruits, one is unable to attain nirvana, uh, so on, are uh, that response to emptiness is not a response that is in that's consistent with an understanding of dependent origination uh, yeah it's it's very easy i would say that the easiest way to read this text and probably one of the uh, easiest tricks you can do for yourself 
is to put dependent origination in for emptiness. Which is what he argues throughout the rest of this <laughs> chapter. Right. So when we're when that... we're reading emptiness, what we're really talking about is this codependent arising. This concept that my experience of something is what manifests it to me in the way it manifests at that particular time. Your experience is conditioned. It's conditioned both by the immediate present as well as by your past experiences and your physical form that causes you to experience to notice such a thing in a particular way. But also that my experience is conditioning. Mm -hmm. and autodidactically, yeah, it, it comes back on myself. I condition myself. In, con yes. in, in experiencing my conditioning, I'm conditioning. And you condition the experience. Right. You, it, it, it presents itself to your... It, it presents itself on the basis of what you're expecting and your prior prejudices, all of that. So, so yeah, it's, it's a loop. Right. And this is very different from the emptiness that simply says nothing exists, nothing means anything, nothing matters. Right. Because the, the basic question which the interlocutor puts forward which i think most people start at is if if it's all empty then what's the point what what is how, how can you have the noble truths you assert that suffering exists uh and that it's caused by ignorance and clinging and that one has to reject ignorance and clinging in order to get rid of suffering and there's a way to do this but then coming back around saying it's all empty so that implies the suffering itself is empty, which ultimately, yes, it is. But that doesn't help somebody who's presently suffering. Their suffering is extremely real and extremely reified. So what to suggest that the Four Noble Truths are empty is not to say that they're meaningless, but to say to suggest that suffering is empty is not to say that it's meaningless, is to say that it has causes. It is dependent on other things, and it in turn uh, conditions what's going to happen in the future. Right. I think the commentary gives us um, a little bit more insight as well. It says that the opponent right, has taken the um, perspective of emptiness in the way that you were explaining, right? That the doctrine is, of emptiness is a nihilist reading, that all things lack intrinsic nature to say nothing whatsoever exists, right? So that's not the position that's being taken. And that's certainly not a position that helps us in our perspective, in our relationship to what it's like to live in today's world, right? Where the existence of objects and of concepts is so widely available on the internet right where the nature of truth the nature of uh, making valid assessments about your environment is harder than ever and mm -hmm. the ability to know the intentions of others and the purpose of anybody else's activity is slightly, um, well, it's, there's some gray, right? There's not as much transparency of other people's intentions or activity on the internet as there is in person, right? We, we, and when you have, uh, empty, uh, the misperception of emptiness here can be carried to the extremes of, post-truth and alternative facts absolutely once, once things are empty one can simply create whichever reality one prefers to exist in and assert it and completely ignore consequences especially uh rejecting or at least being ignorant of dependent origination one imagines one can simply posit whatever ideology or belief they want for fun and dis completely disregard the real effects that it's going to have on other people 
Absolutely. And I think that's what's interesting about studying Buddhism now because of the way that information is now working within our society, because information travels so quickly and because the, um, as Jonathan Haidt has just written, the arbiter of truth is now on the individual, the, the, the consumer of media, and not on the media organization itself to validate any form of reality. And that's why we see these, these buckets of memes forming, right? The, these self-replicating concepts that have nothing to do with valid inference or nothing to do with the concept um, of emptiness, at least as we're discussing it here, right? And that's why you were, uh, what you just so accurately pointed out is that the nihilist example of emptiness gives you the leniency to define reality according to your specific order of your specific memes, I guess, your local memes. Or... Yeah, both from an epistemological stance and from a moral stance. Absolutely. And I think that's it's a fascinating uh, judgment of the arbiter of truth no longer being the media. Uh, the Buddhist perspective, or at least a lot of Buddhist perspectives, certainly the Zen perspective, would be that that was always the case. The individual perceiver was always the sole arbiter of their own truth because you couldn't i don't believe there was a time in history where you could trust media where you could trust governments or economic entities to convey accurate information if it wasn't self-serving so this is simply i think our present age with so much access to knowledge and information is just making it extremely clear what was always the case. It's more difficult to live in a fantasy world now than when we were isolated and where if everybody participated in the same delusion, that delusion was effectively invisible. So what you're saying is that because we're so exposed to each other now, the delusions or the, the mismatches of um, understanding that exists in the world, the memes that maybe aren't so fit, right? That don't um, actually fit with the way that the human experience manifests itself across all of its variation. Um, that those in the digital age, because memes act as information and because culture um, acts in this way where information seems to be the bearer of the cultural identity, at least in many respects, that the information age is putting these ideas in competition with each other. Exactly. Yeah. And in so doing, that is exposing us to what we would, we now see as these, you know, obviously terrible concepts, not fit to do um, life in the modern age, but nonetheless exist because there were insulated and isolated regions of ideology that created um, these concepts that, I mean, some, yeah, some are fitness. working though, right? Like the, the fitness of some of them is quite good, right? They're, they're getting people, um, you know, they're, they're creating a, a lot of violence in our society right now. Some of the memes, mm -hmm. or maybe it's a new meme. I don't know if it's an old meme or a new meme. Maybe we could talk about that, but. Well, fitness uh, doesn't have any ethical implications. Right. The fitness of a meme is simply how well it spreads itself. So there's, it, there, there was a time when violently enforcing ideologies was effective at spreading them, and when peaceful ideologies were less effective because adhering to a peaceful ideology would get one, not the meme, but the physical holder of the meme, uh, would become victimized by somebody who subscribed to a violent ideology right anymore it's and one can see this in population dynamics where if you've got if you've got a predator that's fine it's part of the natural order of things or or a parasite or a disease uh that that is destructive it can be virulent and it can spread and it can be very fit 
up to a point. And there's a point, there's an inflection point beyond which uh, if it is too violent, if it is too damaging to its environment, it gets shut down. And I think we're just seeing now with a lot of the more maladaptive memes, they're getting shut down quicker because the immune, the, the psychological immune system or sociological immune system is becoming more aware of their existence. But at the same time, it could be that the, there could be pockets, especially, especially if they're concealed. Uh, what one has certainly seen in history where you can have these ideologies spreading and spreading and then all of a sudden taking everybody by surprise, even though nobody's really surprised, but having enough power and momentum to flip things at least for a short time sure like um i guess donald trump's election and hitler taking power of germany are two good examples yeah, the, of that mm -hmm. the better comparison is mussolini simply because mussolini rode into rome with a coalition of paramilitary individuals like is essentially militia people and italian law enforcement and the italian military all work together to go into rome invade the legislature uh arrest the more liberal and left-leaning legislators uh, remove them and install mussolini into power and this was in 1920 it, this was in the 20s yeah. Now, as far as that relates to Nagarjuna, I think on several points, the first one is that the nihilistic view falls apart, as does the uh, view of reification, as Garfield puts it. Because again, a lot of ideologies, they posit these memes as real things. They posit abstract ideas right. And the generic ones are like honor and family. And these are very broad, almost I think universal those, concepts. Those are, and the, those skirt the line to me of non existent things like death and age. Mm. I, family is a concept for sure. Right. Like there's, it's relationally existent. Honor sure. is is much less existent. It's it's again it's it's conceptual. One could ma describe it mathematically in game theory concepts. Honor is cooperating with somebody who's previously cooperated with you, right? But even then, that is it's a uh, it's not real in a, in a very physical sense. But then again, what is right? Most things, pretty much every object in my ontology right now is conditioned. It was created based off of a prior idea. Right. And that's what Buddhism is designed to dispel. Is To the, point out. Well, right. To point out and then in so doing, through realization of the fact that it's constructed, not allowing the same type of emotional weights that we allow for things to have to then, you know, I mean, an, a virtual object has an, a virtual amount of emotion that can be added to it, it seems like. And that's, I, I think, why we get this vitriolic political activity that we see that you were just discussing is that there, there's a level of attachment that can exist to the, the imagined object in a way that is far beyond that of what we would call the real. But I'll let you talk. I, I would suspect that there is no neurological difference between the attachment one feels to a virtual object and the attachment one feels to a physical object. My hypothesis would be that it is the same experience of attachment, whether it's something you can hold in your hands that has symbolic weight, uh, a religious icon or a political icon, or whether it's a virtual image of same, it can still inspire love and devotion and psychotic rage. Mm 
and as you said, that's what Buddhism points out is that the emotional way, like, like buying a pickup truck is is not going to make me uh, more masculine, and buying a hybrid is not going to make me more ethical or moral. Uh, there, but both vehicles can still kill me if I walk out in front of one and it runs me over. So it's not when we say these things aren't real; it's a very specific sort of reality that we're talking about and as you said that has a lot to do with the emotional weight that inheres in them i think that's a lot of what gives them their at least their existence for our decision making in a lot of cases right like we have a you did the reason we don't walk out in front of cars or and just to use your example right the reason that one does buy a car a big car right a big truck right, with big rims and big wheels. It's pretty much everybody knows, right, is that, that they're compensating for some other aspect. Or it's very possible that they have some type of job that requires it. But it's almost never the case that anybody who has a vehicle that's excessive that is obviously being used for a utility practice, right, you don't see people getting flack for that. You see people getting flack for uselessly acquiring something that the concept of having it, right? There's an association between the real work truck and that truck, right? And everybody knows mm. that the relationship is false, right? Everybody knows that the person who works in that work truck, right? At least ontologically speaking, right, in our society, right? probably has a lot of those characteristics that the person who's buying the truck is trying to imbue on themselves right well even even right here it's very we're starting to immediately run into some of the uh emptiness of concepts and dependence contextual dependence in this case of concepts um it's very dangerous to say everybody knows anything and but you're totally right to point out the distinction between uh somebody who has a work truck and somebody who has an ego truck and occasionally i those could be the same person one could have a work truck that is also <laughs> a political statement or one could have a work truck and be a member of a union and be extremely pro union and extremely pro working class um social support the whole gamut and the the point here is that it's easy to just see the truck and immediately attach an entire raft of uh skandhas to that yeah say that oh this represents this whole laundry list of things when as is the case it's entirely empty and in this instance right. emptiness means that each individual instance is going to be unique and it's going to be dependent on circumstance there is no essence. There's no essential uh, manliness pickup truck owner. Manliness yeah. of the pickup truck, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those those imbued properties don't exist. So the the negative The nihilistic view, we also, it reminds me of, oh, and he leads up to the two truths ultimately, which I think is critical to the whole exercise of dependent origination. But to close out the nihilistic view of what emptiness isn't, um, it leads up to the distinction you'd brought up a very long time ago between epistemic and ontological nihility and i don't know if you recall talking about that but the difference between something not being true and something not being real right and i think that's what the uh two truths and the response to the opponent's assertions of nihilism uh, starts to approach yeah i would agree with that i think that i think that's i mean insofar as um 
those ideas um, represent that the truth is that things are dependently originated, I guess. Well, uh, there's the two. I mean, we can start with it does... In one sense, everything starts with epistemology, perception. You know, perception and inference conditions what we know, and what we know conditions our experience of reality. Mm -hmm. In the other sense, you can have an ontology without an epistemology. You can it, there would simply be no observers of it. Right. So something can be, and so like the pickup truck, for example, is a very real object. To say that the truck is true is. Uh, that's that's yeah. a much more nebulous assertion. Um, is the truck it obtains. true? Yeah. Uh, now, now is what the truck represents true? Is that true masculinity, or is that true patriotism, or is that a true work ethic? Uh, An existent one in this case. In the case of mm -hmm. what part? The... Um, I mean, obviously, the Buddha says no, right? It's, it's there's no the well maybe there there are truths actually that is true actually sorry the Buddhists would ex, would say that yes those things are true because they're conventional yeah they're conventionally true and being aware of the convention as he says in verse ten uh, without a foundation in the conventional truth the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught. So if one does not understand how one's conventional reality operates, if you simply wave your hand and say, oh, it's all meaningless anyways, you're, you're going to starve to death in three to five days. There has to be some basic understanding of how people live conventionally right? in order to grasp the ultimate emptiness. Right. And he says, so we've, I'm sorry, keep going. Oh, we, we've dispensed with the interlocutor's assertion that, to summarize, if emptiness obtains, there's no point in being a Buddhist. There's no truths, there's no path, there's no Buddha, there's no Sangha, there's no point. Right, there's no, and, there's no point at all. We make our own truths and our own reality, and uh, there's no good or bad, and, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is where the two truths doctrine becomes so important because one has to acknowledge the existence of these incorrect attitudes. Not inc well, not necessarily incorrect, but empty attitudes. Right. One has to acknowledge that most people interact with reality on the level of the object. Yes. And I think that's what's interesting about verse 7, right? Is that there's a distinction between an emptiness of the self and emptiness of the object. Right? Verse 7? Mm hmm. This is what's meant by the, the two truths emptiness of self and emptiness of object. So the I, realizing the subtle level of self-grasping, requires the subtle level of emptiness. And the purpose of understanding emptiness is the elimination of wrong view. And wrong view is that act as the basis for the destructive emotions of, that spontaneously develop for, in, our, in our minds. So the gross level of emptiness that everybody thinks about all the time is the emptiness of the object. And that's what we've been talking about. Is that these concepts, all this stuff is completely empty. And that's interesting because in Buddhism it started in the almost in a reversal of that in that the the emptiness of self was asserted initially that one self is dependently conditioned on there's no atman apart from experience and body 
But the Abhidharma, though they dispense with self, they still asserted the existence of some atomistic objects. Right, and that's the gross level of emptiness. Is the this these objects. The subtle level of emptiness is the emptiness of self. Mm. And the classic metaphor is the chariot, which we could apply to the truck in this instance, where it's simply a collection of parts. There's wheels, there's axles, there's, right. in this case, an engine or a horse, but there's nothing, there's no individual part that has the essence of the whole. And you parse it and parse it down further and further, and eventually you either get to atoms or dharmas, as the apidharma posited, or as Nagarjuna posits, you can parse it infinitely and you wind up getting to nothing that has its own separate existence. Right. Yeah. Nothing exists objectively, nothing exists independently. Well, nothing exists objectively for the sheer fact that nothing can be observed right. objectively. All perception is subjective. Right. All knowledge comes from subjective observation. And because of that, nothing exists independently. Because everything exactly. exists in dependence. And everything that we know exists is conditioned by a brain. That's one of the fallacies of the objective stance that's another thing that can be shown to be empty yet reified because there is the only objectivity can only be approached by essentially summing a whole collection of subjective experiences which is what you were describing with the abhidharma method earlier of people introspecting and then comparing their introspections right all right absolutely and that's why they developed this um that's why they developed this categorization method, right? Is because while it's useful to recognize that the categories are empty, right? Like that's that's what Nagarjuna is really trying to point out here, I think, right? Is yes. while it's, it's useful for that, right? They still need to be addressed because overcoming them or letting go of them, letting go of the attachment that you've created to them, is in the understanding of their emptiness, of their emptiness of being intrinsic, of being transient, of being dependent. Yes, and you have to you have to know what it is you're letting go of. You have to understand what you're studying because otherwise you'll just take it as a given and then you won't be able to overcome it. Right. So what emptiness does or focusing on emptiness this is Quoting the Dalai Lama, focusing on emptiness single pointedly shakes the root of the objects of perception and decreases attachment to them. This is, there's a fascinating neurological effect. Uh, when one picks up an object, one is looking at it and picks it up, and that in and of itself is a phenomenal feat. Brings it up to your face, you know, you smell it. All of those different perceptions are happening at different speeds. The nerve impulses travel at different speeds. The brain processes the information some more quickly than others. And then there's another fa factor, there's another part of the brain that unifies all of those different uh, individual sense data and, and collects them into this thing that we call an object. But even the, the, our sensation of now, of perceiving, seeing, and smelling something simultaneously, that now is manufactured by the brain. That was something that uh, we were looking at in the Metzinger book. And another fascinating thing about smell is that their, the spin on certain molecules <laughs> is determines their smell. Because there are certain smells that are the same shape molecule. <laughs> That smell totally different. Hmm. <laughs> that's some. I mean, that's some interesting stuff that makes you wonder. Like that makes you think that you really do need to have a an acceptance of the real, right? Or an acceptance that there are at least dependently originated objects in Convention. order to, in order to make sense of what's going on. Right, because yeah, you need to know what the conventions are. Because science 
science produces real conventions, produces valid conventions, I would say. That's what's interesting yeah, we- about the digital age, right? Is that we've gone, we, we understand matter so well that we can make it move information. Um, and enco- I mean, encoding information and in matter is arguably the foundation of, uh, of history. Certainly I wouldn't say of culture unless you define speaking as encoding it in air, but certainly writing, right. Uh, is yeah, we've, we've getting the matter to move. It's we, we've gotten it to move faster. We've reduced the friction and increased the flow. Right. And I think that is the key explosion but also science as science tells us and the dalai lama he loves his quantum physics and i think sometimes he plays yes, he a little fast and loose with uh, some some definitions that may make more rigorous materialist cringe but the fact of the matter is objects are 99.9 percent empty space this is something that science tells us that's mm-hmm. empty space held together by the electrostatic force but that's also and not what we mean by emptiness no that is not what we mean by emptiness neither is that <laughs> what sorry. we mean by conventional truth right and it's an important point because there are, there are certain conventional truths there are certain truths that science produces that are uh more or less useless for a person's interaction with conventional reality all right. like quantum physics is hugely important for computers, right. but knowing that things are mostly empty space is more, it's more of a conceptual, like, I think it does help as far as recognizing dependent origination. Right. Because no, because the point of, of, re, of realizing emptiness is that we're looking at the, we're realizing that the ground of existence is dependently originated and not completely static yes and that goes all the way back like if we're looking at the emptiness in objects isn't in the fact that they're mostly empty space it's in the fact that there are protons and electrons and that's all or even and you know we're now starting to think that maybe the whole world is holographic and information based uh, and that's that's something we could talk about at another time too, if you wanted. But it seems mm-hmm. to me that as we get right, as we um, look deeper and probe more, um, more into the nature of reality, we start to discover that what's there is very much um, an interaction manifestation, and no. that's why so, I'm sorry. Oh, it could wind up being the case that ontological nihilism obtains <laughs> that even the protons and the electrons are not real they're, 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 they're not atoms they're not existent but they're simply informational products of a of a surface that is projecting into this realm yeah i think that's pretty much the argument that's being given right now <laughs> believe it or not Either way, we know they're dependently originated from the Big Bang. It was right. hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium, and that's all. And it took star formation to start producing nitrogen and oxygen and carbon and all those. And it took many, many billions of years longer to achieve stars that went supernova and produced let elements heavier than iron mm-hmm. lead and gold and all of this so even the periodic table itself is dependently originated and the then elements are not elemental and then all of the elements that couldn't be made in stars right that have mm-hmm. to be have to be produced by the collision of two neutron stars mm-hmm. so we have even that layer right where two Two independent entities must die, produce, you know, the the elements that they've produced, and then go on to be large enough to be neutron stars and then be in close enough proximity with another neutron star (laughs) to produce even heavier elements. And that's why I think a useful appendum to 
Nagarjuna's work, his doctrine of two truths, within the category of conventional truth, right? I think it's handy to imagine multiple different conventional truths that apply at different levels in different contexts. You've got you've got truth at a at a very hard scientific level. Uh, you've got truth at a social level. You've got truth at a legal level. Legal truth is truly bizarre, but it's it's relevant. It's very valid to day to day existence. For instance, you can't. I was thinking about this in terms of the study of history is based on firsthand texts, and a lot of firsthand sources are legal codes. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which a legal code cannot be a lie. Like if if the law was written down and voted on and decided upon that, that is the law. The law could be premised on a lie. It could be a bad law, uh, but the law itself, there's no... There's no honest laws and dishonest. It's it, that is what happens to be the law. So, and it can't be. You you can't. You could have a fake law, I suppose. But what it boils down to is that there's there's a construction there. There's another extra layer of social truth that we start to get into, uh, that's heavily weighted with symbolism. And as we enter, enter, as we expand the digital age and the digital level, that's only going to become more the case. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, conventional truth is uh, defined, at least by uh, the Dalai Lama, to give us a little bit of grounding as the renown known to all in worldly convention, the nominal existence of things. So mm. just exactly like what you were talking about. I mean, nothing, you know... Super extra, other than to provide a little bit more, I get a few extra words to think about what conventionality means. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of scientists would like scientific truth to be placed in the ultimate category. But, well, I mean, insofar as the ultimate truth is absence of independent existence, um, Science more or less continually proves that. Yeah, and so it seems as though, right, And there have been some people, and this is one of the reasons that the Dalai Lama is so interested in science, at least modern science, is because modern science, um, the introspective inferential nature of science, the anumana of science, the inference of science, is one of the valid means of cognition or at least the valid means of proof. So, um, science is not necessarily a way against the ultimate truth. We're not trying to get rid of the world. <laughs> no, and convention and ultimate, they're not opposed to one another. No, but one is constructed and the other, the other isn't. Almost by its nature or by definition, he's defining ultimate truth as that's that which isn't constructed. And I think, moreover, that which is not. Um, and we see that, too, in Nirvana. Conceptual. Ah, yeah. Well, Nirvana, the root of Nirvana is blowing out or extinguishing, literally extinguishing the flame of desire. Right. So one, one achieves Nirvana by by surpassing ignorance which is very apropos to this and also by surpassing the craving which in this case i think would be people's craving for meaning a craving for independent self-existence and knowing that other things exist these are my things they're my property they belong to me they will never go away they will never break down or get old neither will i that's the attachment that one needs to transcend in order to achieve the bliss of nirvana. Right. This is my favorite verse. Which one? Um, 11. By a misperception of emptiness, a person of little intelligence is destroyed. Like a snake incorrectly seized, 
or a spell incorrectly cast. For that reason, that the Dharma is deep and difficult to understand and to learn, the Buddha's mind despaired of being able to teach it. <laughs> and this is, I guess this is Nagarjuna's explanation for why uh, the Buddha never taught the Dharma in its and never taught the Dharma in its complete nature, at least the way he experienced it. Yeah, in the he always... in the suttas, because there is that is uh, an assertion of the Mahayana that there were these these secret teachings or more advanced teachings that were held back because people weren't ready for them. But even in the suttas, the Buddha after awakening seriously considered simply sitting there in awakening being awakened uh, because he saw that should he attempt to teach it it would be misinterpreted it would be difficult to guide others it would take a while and it would probably eventually die out so there, there's there's a shortly after i think it's the verse on uh another one of my favorite verses on how essentially the universe is a house on fire um he debates with himself whether or not he should attempt to guide others and eventually chooses to do so, which is why we have the teachings that we do. Just because he despaired of being able to teach it, ultimately he did teach. And it seems like it took a profound number of years, almost a thousand years, for people to start to come to the realization of what he was talking about. Because I think, the, I mean, he talks about the middle way, but the schools that develop out of the, the, the Theravada school, right? Uh, that school still holds on to a lot of the fun, a lot of the conventional aspects of the self and of the world, right? And it's not until yeah, Mahayana. Well, yeah, right. It doesn't hold on to the self, but it creates a uh, a compendium of the world, right? It starts to categorize the world. And it's not until Mahayana that you see a transition back to something that's less about categorization and more about personal psychological understanding. Well, the Theravada is still enormously effective. I mean, the, the it still exists as a movement, and much of modern mindfulness, uh, much of what's being studied now in medical contexts, as well as the Vipassana movement, insight meditation, all of those are based on the root teachings. They're based on the Theravada traditions. And they work because uh, they ontologize real objects, which is how most people think about the world. Yeah, they were they were never wrong. And I think that's why I think that's one of the issues that we run into. Right. They're not here wrong. is yeah, opposing conventional truth and ultimate truth, opposing Abhidharma and Madhyamaka or Mahayana and Theravada, Sarvastivada, the, all the Vinaya traditions, uh, they are different. They're skillful means is how it gets interpreted. They're different paths to the same goal. Right. But within the schools themselves, they do not see it that way. Right. No. And even today, you'll still get uh, yeah, the, competition like that. The, the, the bait tradition within Buddhism is very strong. Which is part of the oh, reason yeah. that it survived as long as it has and gotten as precise as it has. Mm -hmm. And as varied. Because again, varied, Nagarjuna, yeah. what we're reading now, the Heart Sutra that we read is a foundational, it's recited every day in Zen monasteries. And Nagarjuna is also a key figure in the Tibetan tradition and in the Tibetan tradition debate is huge and study of all this and commentary on all this is huge as well and it produces real results as evidenced by a lot of the research done on many Tibetan monks and that's because at least in my opinion 
the skillful means of allowing for there to be all of these objects and to have all these categories makes a lot more sense um, and attaches a lot more easily to the Western mind than some of the more uh, esoteric emptiness claims that we see in Nagarjuna. I mean, we spent a good like 30 minutes to an hour, possibly even longer of this podcast, explaining what we don't mean by emptiness. Right? Oh yeah, and which all is of the critical. All of the different misconceptions that Western ideology and Western thinking places on the concept of emptiness and how it's played out over the course of our history. Yeah, because uh it Buddhism was initially encountered as nihilistic, if not overtly pessimistic. When in fact it is a response to nihilism and a response to pessimism that does not require the construction of an eternal fantasy. Right. I think that's uh, possibly you could talk a little bit about um, that relationship with Nietzsche. Mm, well, it's the relationship is hilarious because Nietzsche criticize Buddhism as being nihilistic and pessimistic. And, uh, but his only exposure to Buddhism was through Schopenhauer, uh, who had studied some Buddhism as well as the Upanishads and other Indian texts that were just beginning to be translated in the mid 1800s. And the funny thing about Nietzsche's misunderstanding of Buddhism is that it is very similar to most layperson's misunderstanding of Nietzsche as a nihilist and a pessimist. And in both instances, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy, as well as a lot of Buddhist work, rather than denying nihilism and positing something eternal, they address nihilism head on and work to overcome it, work to find a solution to meaninglessness and a solution to suffering that is valid, that is not predicated on fantasies or on non real, empty ideas. And that's uh, why the Dharma is difficult to teach. Mm hmm. <laughs> One comment in here in uh, it's not Sitter, it's in the Garfield version in his commentary. Um, he writes following verse 10 that Nagarjuna is not disparaging the conventional by contrast to the ultimate but is arguing that understanding the ultimate nature of things is completely dependent upon understanding conventional truth. So the major difference, and then later on, um, looking at all of the conventional phenomena, the distinction that I draw is simply that the ultimate truth is non-conceptual. If it has a concept associated with it, it's conventional. Mm. Yeah. So the ultimate truth is non conceptual. And because concepts are almost again by by their very nature well, natureless, but concepts are constructed. Mm hmm. So the absence of independent existence is not concept. It can be. But it's a process. It's the process out of which concepts and everything else emerge. Dependent, co-arising. Yeah, essentially the, the root, the, the key thesis here is that if things existed, because something can't come from nothing. If things existed, they could not have come into being, and 
having come into being, they could not change or cease. Right. The only way for anything to come into being and then cease being is if it never was to begin with. Right. It never had intrinsic nature to begin with. Hmm. Because then it never would have come into being. It would have already always been a being. Garfield addresses the Western approach as well. He observes, he doesn't reference Nietzsche, but he observes that Madhyamaka's philosophy suffered the same fate as much Western skeptical philosophy, including that of Peronians and of Hume and Wittgenstein, all of whom were at considerable pains to warn readers against interpreting them as denying the existence of ordinary entities but all of whom have been repeatedly read as doing so. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to verse four, which for whom, for him to whom emptiness is clear, everything becomes clear. For him to whom emptiness is not clear, nothing becomes clear. Because it just winds up being another concept. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Because then, yeah, I mean, emptiness is just a yeah. It's a concept that is, that means the lack, right? When actually, emptiness is being meant as, right? This is another perfect example of when we can read emptiness as dependent origination. For for whom, for him to whom dependent origination is clear, everything becomes clear. Or him to whom dependent origination is not clear nothing becomes clear because the person who to whom dependent origination is not clear still is attached to these concepts of non-existence and existence and when you're attached mm -hmm. to non-existence or, or or existence or both right as we can be maybe in the world that we live in now right with the virtual the digital right well, nihilism in the world we live in now is an aesthetic. Okay. What do you mean by that? I mean, it's an emotional, like, because uh, when, when I think of contemporary nihilism, I think of Rick and Morty. And the, the approach, that sort of valence towards reality, uh, which, again, could be closer to this than we imagine, but there's this attitude of, oh, nothing matters, nothing means anything, it's all fake. Might as well get drunk and be an asshole uh, because nothing means it. That's the, the sort of nihilism. And I think what a lot of people imagine when they think of nihilism is, is an amoral, apathetic approach to life. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's because.